surely alive and he's living it on the inside Roaring like a lion, my God's not dead He's surely alive and he's living it on the inside Roaring like a lion, my God's not dead He's surely alive and he's living it on the inside Roaring like a lion, my God's not dead He's surely alive and he's living it on the inside Roaring like a lion The ground with the sound of revival. Let heaven roar and fire fall. Come shake the ground with the sound of revival. and happy Easter. And we gather together to celebrate this fact that Jesus is alive today. And uh, there's something that the church has done through, uh, through the ages. And, and uh, let, let's do this again this morning where, where a person would say, to affirm this truth, the person would say, he is risen. And the people would reply back, he is risen indeed. So, so if we can try this together, let's go for it, okay? He is risen. He is risen. Amen. And we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ because of what he's done to us and for us. And so on this Easter, where he reigns forever, Jesus makes all things new. And what a difference a few days make. And so on Good Friday, we remembered that Jesus died on the cross. And we started off with a very solemn, empty cross. And if you haven't yet had a chance, uh, make sure you grab a flower and, and attach it to, to the cross as celebration of this new life and how Jesus makes all things new. Jesus is worthy, and we celebrate him today. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing
pray. Jesus, you are good. And God, we proclaim with our voices, with, with, with our lives, that you live forever, that you have conquered death, that you have risen from the grave. And God, what a great day to be able to celebrate and focus on you. And so, Lord, we, we ask your blessing on, on, these service, on this service, on, on our lives, God, that you would work in our hearts and in our minds. God, help us to to live changed lives forever because of what you've done. And Lord, thank you that you meet us right where we're at. Whatever our past has been, God, we know what our future is like when we trust in you. And so God, we look to you and we pray that you would lead us. God, thank you so much for this Easter. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
We're going to continue worshiping God through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. And I want to invite the ushers to come forward and begin passing the plates. As they do that, I want to make you aware of two important announcements that, that are going on. The very first one is that on April 10th, in, in just uh, two weeks away, we're going to do a very special Sunday called a small group Sunday. And this is a Sunday where we're focusing on how we need each other and how we ought to be in, in groups connecting with each other and praying for each other. And life goes better when we can do life with each other and be there through the ups and through the downs. So this is an important day. Mark it on your calendar. It's a Sunday. We're going to talk about discipleship and growing together with each other. So this is a Sunday you will not want to miss. So April 10th is that Sunday. A Sunday where you need to know something different is going on is April 24th. And remember that we're meeting here at 9.45 a.m. to do a commissioning and a prayer. And then we're going out into the community. And uh, opportunities are, are coming in. Watch for details on our Facebook page, on our email, next Sunday and beyond. We'll be talking about different opportunities for, for us to have an impact at schools in, in Clarkston and beyond, to have an impact at, at different organizations that are helping the needs in this area. And so we're joining together with organizations in this area and churches in this area to not just come and do church, but to go out and to be the church. So again, that is April 24th. You'll just want to um, count your calendar and mark that on your calendar accordingly. Uh, I want to invite Pastor Carrie. She's got a very special kids moment for us that she'll be sharing. Okay, I'd like to invite all of our elementary kids, our young kids, the people who are young at heart and want to come sit on the floor. Anybody's invited, come on up here and sit on the floor with me. Come on up, come on, don't be shy. No shy, just come join me, it's gonna be fun, I promise. Here, Luke. <laughs> here, just save me a spot right here. I'm always reminded that I'm not very tall at moments like these. I feel like I just blend right in. <laughs> well, happy Easter, guys. I love holidays. Raise your hand if you love holidays. Oh, they're so much fun. And you know, the best part about holidays is every single holiday, we are celebrating something, right? So when it's Valentine's Day, we're celebrating St. Valentine and mostly love, right, on Valentine's Day. And on Christmas, we celebrate the birthday of Jesus. And on St. Patrick's Day, which we just had, we celebrate um, St. Patrick. And we also celebrate all things green and Irishy stuff, right? <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure on all of that, but it's fun. I like to celebrate stuff. And so with this being Easter... I'm wondering who can tell me what are we celebrating today? Riley, I saw your hand first. Um, we're celebrating that Jesus had ridden, risen from the cross. Yes, absolutely. That wasn't a trick question, and I know that you guys all know that. So we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter. That means when he came alive again after dying on the cross. But I wanted to tell you guys something that maybe you've never considered that the Easter story does not actually begin with the life, the death, and then the coming back to life again of Jesus. It actually begins with some very famous words that I bet most of you have already heard before. These words are this, in the beginning. Anybody hear those words before? Where do they come from? The Bible. The Bible, yes. Genesis. Genesis. Absolutely. That, as a matter of fact, those three words are the very first three words of the entire Bible. The entire Bible begins with in the beginning because it's the beginning of God's story and the story he wants us to know. And so it goes like this. You can say it with me if you know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, God made the entire universe. He made the earth that we live on. He made all the plants and the animals. And then finally, he made people. And he made people very special. The Bible tells us that he made people in his own image. And he created us people with a special purpose. And that purpose, the Bible tells us, is to be in friendship with himself. So we were made to be friends with God. Very, very special we were made. And when God was done with all that creating, do you know what he said? He said, this is good. 
God was pleased with everything he made, and he said, this is good. But you know what? Soon after that, something happened that changed all of that. Does anybody know what happened? Um, Peyton. Um, Adam and Eve sinned. She said, in case you couldn't hear, Adam and Eve sinned, and that's exactly right. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And when they did, they let sin into the world. Is that actual blood? No. <laughs> it is not actual blood. No. That'd just be gross. Now, if you noticed, before the sin came into the world, did you notice that water? That water was good. Just like God had said cre creation was good. It was clean. It was clear. It was refreshing. It looked like you could drink it. Does it really look like something you want to drink now? Especially since you don't know what I put in it and thought some of you thought it might be blood, which it's not. Um, but no, it's not good because sin ruins things. And when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, which every single one of us has also chosen to disobey God, that's what sin is, and they let sin into the world, they took what was good and it got ruined because sin ruins things. It really does. Now, we all know what sin is. Sin is the bad things that we do and the bad things we think and the good things we know we ought to do but we don't do. Those are what sins are. So really quick, I'm just going to name off just a few. So like um, lying and stealing and cheating and being selfish and being greedy and disobeying our parents. And well, the list goes on and on and on and on, doesn't it? There's just a lot of them. And the Bible says that we've all sinned. And sin does ruin things. It ruins our world and it ruins our lives. I want you to think for a second about the effects of sin for a second. Because we all think about what sin is, but have we ever thought about what sin does? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt sad yes. in your life? Yes. That's an effect of sin, actually. When God created the world and said it was good, he didn't expect sadness to be a part of it. Sadness is not good. And that was not a part of it. But sin's effect is sadness. How about angry? Have you ever been angry? Yes. Have you ever been afraid? Yes. Lonely? Yes. Have you ever felt jealous? Yes. Have you ever felt selfish? Yes. So much honesty. <laughs> There's just so much honesty in the room tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, all right. How about this? Have you ever been sick before? Yes. How about a more serious one? Have you ever known someone who has died? Yes. Yes. See, those are the effects of sin. This is what sin brought into our world. God did not want that. He created the world good. But when we choose to disobey God and to sin, we bring those consequences, those effects into the world, all those yucky things, and it's no longer good. But the worst thing that sin did is it ruined that friendship we were designed to have with God. Remember how I said people were created special? And they were created to have a friendship with God. But when we chose sin, we ruined that friendship with God. But God loves us so much that he didn't want it to stay that way. And so that is why Jesus came. Jesus is God in human form. So he was born, we celebrate his birthday on Christmas, and he lived a perfect and sinless life, which only God can do, by the way. No one else has ever done that. And then he died on the cross to pay the price for all the bad things that every one of us has done. When he went on the cross, he was saying, because he never, he never did sin, so he didn't have to die. But he said, I want to go on that cross and take all the bad things that Mrs. Gerald has ever done and everybody else in this room, and I want to pay the price for them. And an amazing thing happened when Jesus died on the cross for us, he was able, in his death on the cross, he was able to take sin away.
and he was able to make everything good again. I know, that's so cool. I'll tell you how later. <laughs> and while you're trying to figure it out, let me tell you why this is important. Because we still have sin in our world, right? So you're still going to have times of sickness and sadness. But what Jesus did on this cross was he showed you that you can be forgiven and that your heart can look clean and good and right and refreshing again, just like it did, just like he planned when he created you. You can be forgiven. You can have a relationship with God, a friendship with him again, and you can have the hope of living with him forever in heaven because Jesus did this. Now, what's important about Easter is that Jesus did pay for our sins when he died on the cross, but he also showed that he's way more powerful than sin because one of the biggest effects of sin is death. And Jesus did not stay dead. And three days later, Jesus rose up and said, I have power even over death. Nothing can stop me. So if you come to me, nothing can keep me away from you. Nothing. And so this is the greatest gift. This is why Easter is the best holiday ever. But the thing is, you have to receive that gift. It's not just enough to know that that gift is there. If you got a gift and it had your name on it, but you never opened it, would you know what was inside? No. So here's how you open the gift. The first thing you have to do is to believe that this is true, that Jesus really did come. He really did die for your sins. He really did rise from the dead. And the second thing that you have to do is just to receive the gift is just to talk to him. We call that praying. You can actually even do it in your mind. He can hear what you're saying in your mind, which is cool because he's God. And here's how you do that. You just talk to him and say, Jesus, I believe that you did this for me. And I'm sorry for the, the choices, the bad choices I've made, the sins that I have done. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask that you would come into my life and lead my life forever. And if you do those things, then you can know that what Jesus did, he will make your heart as clean and new as it ever could be. And that relationship that you were created to have with him, that friendship will be restored. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and pray. We're going to all pray together. I'll pray out loud. But any of you who are feeling like, I really would like that. I'd like to know that I'm forgiven today and that I have that friendship back with God. And I just want to tell Jesus, thanks for dying on the cross for me. Whether you're sitting here or whether you're sitting there. It's all true for all of us. And so I'm going to pray. And if you mean that, those words with your heart and you're just saying them in your head along with me, then God is hearing you. And today will be the day that your sins can get forgiven and your life can be changed forever. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for loving us enough to say you wanted to pay the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven and we could have a friendship with you again. We believe that you did this and that you rose up from the grave, that you're alive today. God, I ask that you would forgive us for the times that we've disobeyed. And we ask that you would come into our lives and be the leader of our lives for the rest of our time here on this earth. And thank you for the hope of heaven and being with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, you guys. I know you've got some packets of good stuff to enjoy back at your seats. You can head back there. Amen. Jesus makes all things new. And there is such a contrast to where we were at as humankind before the cross and before Jesus rising on that very first Easter Sunday. And, and, and the contrast that takes place before and after that is just stunning if you think about it. And so we remembered on our Good Friday service where we were at, and we, we took a look at a cross that was empty and bare and solemn and simple. And that cross represented that our Savior came and died 
But we celebrate and we remember today that he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. But he rose again and he lives forever. And this is what we celebrate at Easter. And this is why we ought to celebrate like none other. This ought to be the greatest celebration. This ought to be the biggest celebration. Because God has wired us as humankind to be quite, quite good at celebrating. And we can take our examples from different areas of life and times where we enjoy cheering on and celebrating, clapping. But, but we as human beings, we're wired to be creatures who can celebrate well. And I, I want to share with you just a quick observation that I have about, uh, about celebration, about joyful times uh, like this. And, and this observation is this, that the greatest joy comes from a resolution of desperate circumstances, okay? The greatest celebration can come when, when circumstances are dire. And so let me, let me paint the picture in, in this way. And two things that I, that I see in this. And, and there's probably more, but these are two I want to highlight. Number one is when you're in desperate, desperate circumstances. So in sports, this, this becomes very, very plain and clear. When, when your team is down and you think there's no way, you're ready to turn off your TV, the players seem like they might be ready to give up, and, and you're just thinking there's no possible way we will overcome and have victory here. But then a miracle happens, and that shot goes in and the play is made, the tackle is missed, or this sensational opportunity, this sensational moment happens, and then all of a sudden you're going to be victorious. There's a lot of joy that comes in, in a circumstance like this. But the other part of this, that's the, that's the first part of it for me, okay? The other part of it is the stakes have got to be high, okay? And ideally, the stakes are the highest, the championship game, the Super Bowl. And here's a few sports pictures that, where the stakes are really, really high, and you can, you can identify. And these guys aren't fighting each other. I mean, it, it looks like they, but this is totally celebration, exuberance, uh, serendipity in this awesome moment where miracle on ice happens, or Super Bowl victory, or, or you're, you're crowned the fastest man ever. You know, those moments just give sheer exhilaration, okay? And I'll submit to you that you, you have this when the stakes are the highest, okay? I dare somebody, you know, at a scrimmage, you know, to, uh, to dump Gatorade on your coach and see if that goes over well, okay? It's not going to, okay? But you can get away with it at the Super Bowl, okay? Because the stakes are so high. So, so in this, the greatest joy, the greatest celebration, the greatest uh, exuberance comes from a resolution of desperate circumstances, Okay? And if we're honest, we as humankind, before the cross, before Easter, this is exactly where we were at. We were in desperate circumstances. Things were not good. And the stakes were the highest because God recognized this and realized this and, and he sent his only son to fix this. I mean, God in flesh coming and living the perfect life. The stakes were, were absolute highest, even to the point where he was willing to give his life on the cross. So the stakes had never been higher. Restoration is what we needed. And the, uh, this picture is painted quite well in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And Paul says this. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, uh, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the state of our heart, the state of our lives. Where we were at was under the stain of sin, was under this burden that we had that we could do nothing about on our own. And so this is what we celebrate at Easter, that God overcame these desperate circumstances. We needed something to be done, and Jesus did it by dying on a cross and by rising again. So again, to paint the whole picture, to understand and appreciate this all, all the more, we, we ought to see the big picture in this. And we all know brokenness, but... But we know this, even, even before this, even before we, we ruined this, our relationship with God, is this fact that God created us to be in a relationship with him. I mean, just as Carrie mentioned, it happened at the very beginning when God started everything and God created humankind, Adam and Eve. 
And the picture that's painted in Scripture is God walking with them, is God talking back and forth with them, God having this perfect fellowship with his creation. You know, I wonder if they laughed. I wonder, you know, if, if, how they shared. But, but God was in a perfect relationship with his creation, and we blew it. Okay, and so the way that God intended all things was, is captured in, throughout Scripture. Leviticus is just one verse that I picked, but this happens Old Testament, New Testament, throughout the story of Scripture. And this is God's heart desire that he lets us in on. And he says this in verse 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. I mean, this is God's heart desire that he created us, he designed us, he loves us. And he wants to walk in, in and with us and be in, a, in this relationship with him. But we ruined it. Because God who is holy can't be with sin. And God who is holy didn't make us robots or, or puppets, but gave us a free will. And with that free will, we could choose to love him and embrace him and seek him. Or we could choose to reject him. And we as humankind, this is what we did. Because not too long after God created everything, Genesis 3, 6 captures these words. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate and brought upon them and all of us, the stain of sin. And it wasn't just Adam and Eve that brought on the stain of sin, but it was you and me. It was every person who has ever lived. We've all sinned. And I might think, think back and, and be like, well, maybe there were some really, really good uh, people in the Old Testament, let, or, or New Testament even, and let's take a look at some of their lives. And we might name off some of these heroes of the faith that we sing songs about, that we memorize Bible verses about, that we tell Bible stories about, but realize that they were also broken people under the same stain of sin that we are. And we take a look at Abraham. Okay, Father Abraham and this great song that we learn as kids and, and how Abraham had this great faith, but Abraham failed in life at times. He lied. He, he recorded in scripture as someone who has lied. Jacob Okay, when we talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and this great man of faith, and, and who Israel is named after, and, and Jacob is this great guy, right? Well, he's known as a deceiver in scripture. Okay, Moses, well, surely Moses, this great prophet, he did everything right, right? Well, no, Moses had his failures as well. God told him to speak to the rock, and, and Moses hit the rock in a, in a moment of rage uh, and, and allowed this anger to overcome him. And so he sinned, and he had sin. And you have David, and David did a lot of great things, but David did some horrible, horrible sins. You have Peter, and, and you'd say, surely, surely the, this one who was so close to Jesus, who walked with him, surely we could look at him and say, well, he might have been sinless. Well, no, recorded in scripture is Peter on the night where Jesus was betrayed, calling out saying, I don't know him. I don't have any part with Jesus. Stop asking me. We could look to Paul, and Paul calls himself the worst of sinners. You guys, we all know brokenness. Every person ever knows brokenness, knows failures. In that video that we watched, we can all relate to some of those words on there and say, I've been there, I've done that, I know that my life is, has sin in it. Okay? We all know brokenness. A great Bible verse to memorize, and this is a great one to memorize. It's not a good one to put up on the living room wall, okay? But it's, it says this, okay? <laughs> Romans 3.23 captures, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, this isn't a happy Bible verse, but it speaks truth that every person ever has sinned and is under the stain of sin. So when you go to school tomorrow, you're there with sinners. When you're at your workplace, you're there with sinners. When you're at the grocery store, you're, you're there with sinners. When you're driving on the road, well, that one's obvious, okay? Okay, when, <laughs> when we're sitting here in church, we're all alike under sin. We all have this need. There's nothing we can do about it on our own. Romans makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. And so what a difference a few days make. 
Okay? What a difference the cross and what Jesus did on it. And this contrast that happens because we know, again, the wages of sin is death, and here's what's represented uh, under this. Three days prior, we were all, as humankind, under the stain of sin from Adam and from our own lives. And we were all guilty of sin. And this holy God can't be with sin. That's part of what makes him holy and awesome and righteous. We were all slaves to sin in as much as we, we are under the power of sin and the sinful nature and, and kept calling. And so many of those, these words that we read in that, that video come calling and we, we recognize I, 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 we'd, we'd stumble over and over and over again. There was a power that sin had in our lives as humankind. We also had a sacrificial system that was to take place and point the need to, uh, of, of our sin and having it taken away. And the sacrificial system was ongoing because our sin kept going. And the sacrificial system, people would bring these animals without blemish to the temple and they'd be sacrificed for our sins, but it was ongoing and there was no perfect sacrifice. There was no ultimate sacrifice. And not only that, at the temple, as Kurt uh, shared it on Good Friday, there was a curtain that separated the most holy place in the temple where the ark resided, where God's foot stole amongst his people. This big, thick curtain separated God from the rest of humankind. And it was there symbolically and, and, uh, and there to show there was a separation. Followers scattered, okay? This is not an inspiring spot in scripture, but when Jesus died on the cross, those closest to them, most of them ran away and went behind locked door and hid themselves so they wouldn't be next. Okay? They took this and they, they had emotions of fear and, and they would probably describe themselves as cowardly. They, they had struggles. They were, they were uh, depressed. They were not in a good spot at all. And, and in addition to all of this, the Messiah, the Christ, who came and lived the perfect life. He was dead, and he was taken off the cross and buried in a tomb. The wages of sin is death. And these were the desperate circumstances that we as humankind found ourselves in. But that verse that I quoted to you, the wages of sin is death from Romans 6.23, continues on. And it doesn't just stop there. But it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so, yes, we were in desperate circumstances, but check this out. We were under the stain of sin, but because of Jesus, we could have forgiveness from the guilt and stain of sin. We were slaves to sin, and there was a power that sin held over us. But because of the cross, because of Jesus rising from the grave, we can have power over sin. And, and Paul tells us in, in Corinthians that no temptation has seized you, except that what is common to, to mankind. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And we can triumph over sin because of the cross. And we will still fail. We will still blow it. But we have a power in Jesus where, where he helps us to have victory over the power of sin. Sacrificial system was no longer needed. Hebrews makes this very, very clear that Christ died once and for all. That his being the perfect sacrifice that no animal could ever take the place of, that no, no ritual could ever do. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice in dying on the cross and so he takes away the sin of the world. No longer was there need for further sacrifice. That curtain that had separated the most holy place from the rest of the temple, it was torn. And God did this miracle when Jesus died on the cross to show that we could have presence with him and he with us. That Jesus could make all things new. And that relationship which God desires so much with us could happen. And so when we pray when we fellowship, when we, when we talk with God, we can be assured that he hears us, that he's right here with us, his presence. And perhaps we can even picture him bending lower to hear, hear our cries and our pleas. The curtain was torn. Those followers that were scattered and behind closed doors, locked, now, they went, most of them went inspired. Most of them even gave their lives for the cause of Christ. Okay? They spread the gospel. They put their neck out there. They, they took risks. They stepped out in faith, and they were courageous. 
because of Jesus. And many of them even gave their lives for Jesus and for the cause of Jesus. That is, that they were challenged by, by certain groups of people and saying, you need to renounce Jesus and then we'll let you live. But if you hold fast to Jesus, we will kill you. And they said, take our lives. I'm standing up for my faith in Jesus because he lives forever. You can take my life, but what more can you do to me? Because I will be reunited with my Savior, with my God, and I will live forever. So take my life. And these followers were inspired, and they challenged, and they spoke, and they shared the good news. And then we recognize what a difference a few days makes. That Jesus had died on the cross and was buried in a tomb. But he conquered death, and he lives forever. And this is what we celebrate today on Easter. We serve a risen Savior, a living God. We, we don't serve a God who is dead and, and is no more, but we serve Jesus who is living and, and forever and, and will live forever and reign forever. Revelation chapter 21 captures some of these thoughts. And Revelation is the last book of Scripture. It's the last book of the Bible and paints a picture of how Jesus completes making all things new, of this work that, that God has begun where he created us to be in this relationship with him. You want to see how it all ends? Revelation 21 does a great job of capturing this. Verse 1. This is John's uh, vision. This is what he sees, what God gave to the Apostle John. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And Jesus makes everything new. And Jesus changed everything by dying on the cross and by rising from the grave. And so because of Jesus, we can have victory. And because of Jesus, we can relate to words that Paul records in, in Scripture and, and listen to the, what he says to the Corinthian church as he describes this very thing of, of how our lives finish up forever. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 starts with this. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to the pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have victory because of Jesus. We have victory because of what Jesus has done in and through our lives. And so we had brokenness. We were in desperate places, okay? But because of Jesus, relationships can be restored, including our relationship with our creator who desires so much for us to be in a relationship with him. Because of Jesus, forgiveness isn't just an idea, but it's a reality. When we say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Jesus, you, you live forever. Jesus, I want to live according to, to what you're teaching, what you have taught me. I want to follow you. When we do that with our lives, and when we ask his forgiveness, forgiveness is no longer just a thought. It's a reality because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, we have victory because of Jesus, we serve a risen Savior. Because of Jesus, we anticipate the day when Jesus makes everything new, when, the, when creation is, is done with all of its groaning, when, when we, we no longer are under the effects of a fallen world, but we live forever with our Creator in the way that He intended us to live. We can have victory in Jesus because He lives forever. Let's pray. Father God, we love you, 
And God, we thank you so much for your presence here in this place. God, we thank you how it all started and how you desire to be in this relationship with us. And so, Lord, we, we admit that we've blown it. But God, thank you for rescuing us from these desperate circumstances. God, I pray that you would work in, in and through our lives and help us to love you and love others. And God, help us to walk in this renewed relationship. God, you live forever. You reign forever. And God, you are amazing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon Him. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken.
Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I hope you have a wonderful, blessed rest of your day. Thank you for coming.